Hello. Uh, let's see if I'm live. I think I am. Um, we had a Facebook Live failure earlier today, and I thought I would uh, go back and really try to give this to you. Um, questions for... There. Hi. Well, Ariane, so if you're on, then I'm live. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so this is my second uh, Facebook Live, my second uh, Writing Wednesday, and Facebook uh, Live failed me earlier today. I thought I'd try again. So uh, answering your questions about writing. Um, and the first question that came in um, uh, earlier today was, I would love to hear you talk about unlikable characters. We did a little on character last week. Uh, can a character be too unlikable? Is there a danger there? And yes, a, an unlikable protagonist is a dangerous thing. A uh, reader doesn't like them, gets sick of them, and doesn't read on. Uh, but if they're super interesting... Uh, if they have wonderful insights about the human condition, if they're compelling, fascinating, uh, uh, the reader will keep reading to watch what they do. Um, Humbert Humbert in Lolita is a perfect example of that. Um, so yes, you can have unlikable protagonists, but it is harder. Um, I have a lot of people who wrote about the business aspect of writing. How do I get an agent? Uh, how do I get published? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, this is not what I'm going to be writing, uh, talking to you about uh, in these videos. The, the business thing happens after the writing. So I'm interested in the writing. If you're interested in the business, you need to subscribe to Poets and Writers Magazine, like everybody else does. This was my link to the larger writing world. Uh, when I was a young writer, I had no connection to the literary world whatsoever. And Poets and Writers has all that business information. It's the Bible. Uh, everybody uh, subscribes. It's an organization that supports writers. You can go online and uh, check out Poets and Writers. Uh, you need that. Okay, so business is unnecessary. Uh, we had started with a question about adverbs. Um, why are adverbs so strongly advised against when writing fiction? Well, it's because they show the weakness of the verb. Uh, if you need to say he walked hurriedly, then walked, the verb, is not doing its job. Um, you're letting uh, the verb off the hook. Um, you have to make the verb do its job. The only thing that moves in a sentence is the verb. Uh, nouns don't do anything. They, they're blocks, and you can move them around. But um, the only thing that actually has activity is the verb. So you got to get that verb out of bed. you got to get it on its feet and doing what it needs to do for you. So was is the lamest of all possible verbs because it doesn't do anything. It just lies there in bed hoping the nouns will do something for it. Um, get it up. Get it out of bed. Um, they, um, so think of the verb as the weightlifter. You know, so you got to get it up and doing its doing its its number. So don't settle for lazy verbs. Um, uh, the average American, there's about four hundred thousand verbs in the English language, and um, the average American uses twenty to describe everything from the birth of their child to a shot to the moon. Same twenty. I call them the terrible twenty. Um, everybody has their own terrible 20. But the thing about them is that they are like one-size-fits-all t-shirt. Has anybody worn a one-size-fits-all t-shirt? It looks at best, serve, it covers your body, but that's about all. Uh, it's not very flattering. It's not very interesting. Nobody's going to whistle it to you uh, if you walk down the street in that. No. So what we want is not the one-size-fits-all verb, and they tend to be on the order of um, has or has or had, was, um, 
they you look, you see, you watch, you feel or felt, had, put, run, get, got, said, uh, made. And you can look at your own writing. Look at your verbs and make a list for yourself. What are the top 20 verbs that you use? And take a look and how many of them are tailor-made for that spot in the sentence and how many you just grab off the shelf like a bag of Doritos. That's not writing, you know, not yet. Um, so we're going to attend, you attend to that, um, the issue uh, in the verbs. You... Um, In general, you want the verb every once in a while just to knock your socks off. Uh, every sentence has a good word in it somewhere. And a good word, an unexpected word, you know, something that the writer had to work for. Um, and, uh, you know, blow my hair back with the verb. Uh, not every verb, obviously, because that becomes a pattern as well. But you want to... Um, uh, get out of the rut and get out of the one-size-fits-all verb and into some real ratten. Um, and you, you use a thesaurus to expand your vocabulary. I mean, I don't mean you have to replace every verb with something stunning, but it's specificity. Is it the right verb? You know when you're approximating and you know when you've nailed it and you want to feel that you know, often it comes in the rewriting, but address those verbs, really look at them and say, is that working as hard for me as it should? Um, then, um, and just in general, you're going to get out of the one size, you need to get out of the one size fits all writing, nouns, verbs, the whole thing. Um, it goes for patterns, uh, people who use the same words over and over. If you notice you have favorite words, you know, you get like, you get that word once in a story, if it's your favorite word. Um, if it's your, uh, if it's just notice your patterns, you know, look at search, search your document and see how many times, or, or highlight your verbs, highlight, you know, ask yourself how many times do I use the word see or watch? Um, you know, you get like one or two in a page. Um, and the same goes for patterns of sentences. Uh, notice if you write the same sentence. Most people write the same sentence over and over and over again. Uh, the average American will write a 10 to 12 word sentence over and over again with no dependent clauses, nothing short, nothing long, just the same sentence, and the reader falls asleep. Uh, you always want to switch it up. So if you're going to write, sentences are very stretchy. So you can, if you like a long sentence, you know, dependent clauses, use an introductory clause, clause from time to time. It gives the reader confidence that you know where you're going. Um, as he was wondering, X happened. Uh, that's an introductory clause. Um, but sentences are stretchy. So if you notice you like to use long, I tend to like to use long sentences, then make sure to put some short, punchy sentences in there too to keep the reader awake. If you tend to like shorter sentences, connect some from time to time and see if you can it, handle a bulkier sentence. And what that does is it shows the reader that you have control over your language. It's not unconscious. So this is like the next layer of writing here. This is the art. Um, so you want to switch it up. Um, and uh, then I guess the last uh, tip I'd like to talk about right now is the cliche. Now, anybody who's ever studied with me knows that this is a real bugaboo with me. And uh, one class even uh, gave me this at the end of the year. Ban the cliche. And then they wrote, their, they wrote some cliches on the back. You know, they, it was very funny. Anyway, it, it, I never hit anybody with it, my God. <laughs> what am I, a frat or something? <laughs> but kill a cliche, kill it, kill it, kill it dead. Um, 
what is a cliché? Okay, well, a cliché is not just something that um, you've heard a hundred times. Uh, a cliché is not just a uh, worn-out phrase. A cliché is anything you have ever heard before, ever, read before, ever. And as a writer, it's you can't use it. You got to kill that cliche. Um, it's borrowed language. Now, as a writer, our job is to put something fresh and vivid in front of the reader. Uh, something invented just for that spot in that sentence with these characters in that scene. And this is what we owe the reader: is fresh language. It's this is the work. This is the work of writing. Um, so anything you've ever read before, ever. And the difficulty here is that um, the cliché is the mind's shorthand. It's the way our minds work. Um, a penny saved is a penny earned, whatever. White as snow, black as night, uh, big as a house. Um, that's the way our, it's just a, it's a shorthand in our brains. It's a little synapse it's, that's, um closes very easily. But like anything else that's overused, the image wears off like a coin that's been handled too much. You cannot, the reader cannot have a vivid response to something that has been dulled by use. It wants fresh minted coin every time. And um, this kind of thing uh, is where honesty in writing comes in because what happens is the first thing you think of is the overworked, um, the overworked cliche: black as night, you know, white as snow, blah blah blah. But the second thing that will come to mind is something Shakespeare said, or something Virginia Woolf said, and that too is a cliche. I mean, I hate to tell you, but this is where honesty comes in. You have to ask yourself: Have I ever heard that before? Do I know where else that came from? Did I? invent that for this moment? Uh, and if the answer is no, get rid of it. Go back and sit there and ask yourself, what is it? What is it really? Um, for instance, it could be ad adjective noun pairs that you've seen before. Golden sunset. Anybody hear that? Can't use it. Um, fire engine red. You know, there, there are thousands of other reds besides fire engine red, but you need to do the work and think of them. Um, uh, it can be a metaphor, you know, uh, instead of big as a house, quiet as a mouse, you know, you sit there and you try to invent big, what else, what else can be that big? Um, say, let's look at, at round as an apple. Okay. Round as an apple. Um, Surely in your story, with your point of view character, there, is, there are going to be fresh ways of thinking about something round. Uh, round as a river stone. Round as her young eyes. Round as a new Aggie marble. Uh, it can be poetic. It can sometimes even be abstract, you know. Round as a harvest moon, if it's taking place in the autumn. Um, and you can write your way out of a cliché by being more specific. So for instance, round as a Granny Smith apple and twice as tart. You say something original, interesting, gives the reader something for their trouble of reading you. Give them more, give them something more. Writing is a lot of work and it takes a lot of honesty uh, to come up with the fresh thing. Um, so here's an exercise. Make a list of cliches. Uh, you can do the, the adjective noun thing, you know, fire engine red, uh, etc. Make 10 of those. You can do uh, metaphors, quiet as a mouse, big as a house, blah, blah, blah. 10 of them. And then write 10 fresh ways of describing the same thing. 10 fresh metaphors for big as a house. How big was it? How small was it? How, you know, quiet was it? How noisy was it? 
and the fi- and the reds, all the reds. It doesn't have to be fire engine. What else is red? And it doesn't have to be. Um, it doesn't have to be a thing. It can be abstract. Some of the more interesting um, descriptions, metaphors are abstract. Uh, you know. Um, so that's that's uh, just a little bit to start out with. Get those verbs up on their feet and kill the cliche. And we'll uh, we'll talk to you uh, next week. And hopefully at noon Pacific time, <laughs> if I can, if Facebook supports me. All right, thank you. Bye.